Well, it only took me five months, but it's finally here, the second and hopefully last Pandora's Vault video. This video will be split into three different sections. The first will go through some concepts of escape that are either unreliable or straight up won't work. The second section is about the working methods of escaping and breaking in. And the third section includes some things that might make the prison a bit more secure. I'll start with the methods that don't work so that we can come up with the methods that do. When the visitor wants to exit the cell, Awesome Dude uses a dispenser placed at the top of the chute to kill the visitor using instant damage potions. So, hey, oh, what the They'll then respawn in the bed outside of the main cell. If you break the chest and place it in the chute, you'll land on top of it when you respawn. The idea is that you would take out harming potions from the dispenser to use them against the guard when they visit you to give you food, but this is assuming that there are potions in the dispenser. It's completely possible to make a system that keeps the dispenser empty until it needs to dispense a potion. But let's say there were potions in the dispenser. Would you be able to kill a guard with full netherite? I've made you guys both three full sets of netherite that are fully enchanted. We can tell that instant damage 2 is being used here by looking at the recent stream of Tommy exiting the cell while at full health. Without any armor, instant damage 2 does around 6 full hearts of damage like we saw with Tommy, but with full netherite it only does 2 hearts. It will take at least 5 potions to kill a guard, and that's only if you have a direct hit every time. These potions become less effective the further away they are from their target and you can't spam the potions either. If you did it too fast, it would only damage the guards some of the times. Since a player can only take damage every half second, the most efficient throwing rate is once every 10 game ticks. But even then, it would take over two and a half seconds to kill the guard, which is way more than enough time for them to react and kill you. There's no chance of you getting their items. And to go even further, this method was only made for when a guard comes to give you food, but this doesn't even happen anymore. In the newest Tommy visit, you can see that there's something new up in the chute compared to the last time. That's a dispenser for potatoes, which we can see activated here. This means that there will no longer be a time in which a guard will be inside the cell, so having potions is pretty much useless. The biggest issue with using invisibility potions is time. The longest invisibility can last is 8 minutes, but every visit has lasted way longer than that. When you drink a potion, the sound reaches 16 blocks away. There are definitely some places where you might be able to get far enough away to drink a potion without anyone hearing, but you need to follow closely as well to get through every part of the process. The warden would probably notice your particles at some point, especially since you would also get the mining fatigue particles. I guess it's possible to get through everything, but it's definitely not reliable. Making another portal out of the obsidian the room is made out of used to be a possibility, but it's not anymore because the cell has been updated with some crying obsidian, which makes that completely impossible. There were many comments that informed me of a speedrunning strategy used to fight Elder Guardians, where you change your render distance to the lowest amount possible, so Elder Guardians are not processed until you get really close to them. You can really see how this works by this demonstration I set up, where I spawn a gas in the center of each chunk within the two layers of chunks around me. At the default render distance of 8, the gas move normally, but when my render distance is at the minimum of 2, you'll notice that the gas on the outer layer aren't moving. This is because they aren't being processed. If those ghasts were Elder Guardians, they wouldn't be able to inflict mining fatigue on me because they aren't being processed. The issue with implementing this as an escape method is that we have no idea where the Elder Guardians are exactly. We can hear the sounds they make through some of the walls of the prison. Make sure. <gasps> but we don't have a visual of the exact locations. This means that there could be an Elder Guardian directly under Dream's cell within the same chunk, just out of hearing distance, and we wouldn't know until we tried. We do possibly have multiple chances of this working, depending on how many chunks are able to be stood within in the cell. Let's say you stand in one chunk for a minute and receive mining fatigue. If you had another chunk to stand in, you might be able to get lucky and stop the Elder Guardians from being loaded by being in that chunk. Of course, this also depends on no other players loading them in. But how could we know the amount of chunks that are within Dream Cell if we can't access the Dream SMP itself? What if we use references from all the different visits to determine the position of the prison within the Dream SMP world? Using this Dream SMP remake, we can get a decent idea of where the prison is located, but it's not accurate. Just by looking at the streams, we can see the Skeppy Mansion and the prison are way closer than they are in this remake. 
so we need to figure out the position by using something naturally generated. The most helpful landmark I found was this pond right here. I based all my measurements off this pond because when you load up the Dream SMP seed by itself, it's there and stays untouched in the actual server. I used Rambu's clip to figure out the position and length of this wooden path and looked at Tommy's first visit to see how long the mansion was to figure out the z-axis of the bottom left corner of the prison. Figuring out the x-axis was a little more difficult. This crafting table was another helpful landmark. Between Rambu and Sapnap's visit clips, the crafting table is there and in the same position. Sapnap gives a super good angle by launching into the air and looking straight down. We can determine the distance between this part of the pond and the crafting table in Rambu's clip and the distance between the crafting table and that same corner of the prison using Sapnap's clip. The coordinates I came up with was 192x and negative 861z. To find the exact location of the cell, we first need to find the placement of the front lobby. To do this, I analyzed one of George's streams where he swims underneath the prison and finds these lights. The lights we see here are actually used for the floor of the front lobby, and so if we find out how far George traveled from the corner we know the location of to the lights, we can use that to find everything else. I measured the distance traveled by looking at the ocean floor and going off of the six block wide line of dirt outlining the bottom of the prison. I found that the light should be placed at these coordinates. Now that we have the coordinates of something inside the prison, we can make a general layout of it by looking at the different streams of people visiting Dream, and then line up the layout with the light. After doing that, I believe that this block of the cell is located at these coordinates in the real server. And when I turn on the chunk borders, you can tell that there are actually four different chunks you can stand in. But this all doesn't matter anymore, and it's because of the Elder Guardian that we hear in Tommy's newest stream. Hello? In all past clips of prison visits, there were never any Elder Guardian sounds within the main cell. This means that the Elder Guardian is at most within the first layer of chunks that I showed off in the demonstration. These chunks also process entities, so this means that it's very unlikely that this render distance trick would work. Alright, so now that we've seen the methods that don't work, I'll show off some other methods that could also work but are still relying on things that might not be true. I'll cover ways to break out, but also how to break in. Very first thing, Enderpearl stasis chambers. I completely brushed off this method in my last video because I thought that an enderpearl would always despawn when you die, but something that people in the comments pointed out to me is that they actually stay whenever you die while they're in an unloaded chunk. You could use this well by having a stasis chamber far from the spawn chunks or wherever people pass through normally, so that the chunks the stasis chamber is in are almost always unloaded. You would make it through the item checks without the enderpearl knowing that you died. Whenever someone visits, you could write down the coordinates of the stasis chamber so that the visitor can read them without the warden hearing you, and then they could activate it for you. But this would all have to be set up before you're actually imprisoned, so in dream situation, I don't think this would work. In the last video, I covered Cecil's method of going through the lava and logging in and out to get temporary invulnerability, but I feel really bad that their video got way less views than mine. So please subscribe to them, they're a speedrunner with some super interesting content like Tazzed PvP. Since I feel like I kind of stole Sea Soul's idea, I'm gonna come up with a few of my own. So let's say that the netherite block barrier is put up. You can't access the lava to do the Sea Skull method. Since the prisoner is checked on constantly, mining that netherite isn't an option. So now the only bed we can access is the one inside the cell. The answer to getting out of this situation is completely involving these pixels right here. These pixels are actually the bed. First of all, they aren't some video compression artifacts, they stay there for the entire time Tommy looks up the chute. At the end of Rambu's visit, the prison starts falling apart. This reveals some parts of the main cell that we couldn't see before, mainly the bed. For only a small amount of time is it visible along with the piston and block that pushed Dream back into the cell. The placement of the block isn't what I expected though, the open space for you to spawn here is next to the head of the bed, not diagonal from it like I thought last time. This implies that the chute is diagonal to the head of the bed, and when I replicate the bed placement within the chute, I get the same exact pixels. The entire reason why the chute is as tall as it is, is because Awesome Dude knew that the bed was vulnerable and needs to keep it out of reach of the prisoner. I also believe that the method of detection isn't actually string like I thought in the last video, it's a pressure plate. In one of the prison building streams Awesome Dude did, he was making the respawn systems for the guards. He used a pressure plate there and a repeater to power the piston. Dream is also heard taking damage when respawning. 
This also happens during the building stream whenever the redstone repeater is set to a really fast delay. This should work. I'm assuming this is what's being done. Redstone repeaters are blocks that can be broken instantly, so if you did the same trick that I did in the first video where I break the string really fast, but do it to the repeater, you can disable the piston from pushing you off, and break the bed from there. You could also break the chest and place it up inside the chute, and once you respawn, you'll land on top of the chest and you can break the bed. In case there's an observer looking at the bed, you could also break the lectern and put it in the chest before respawning, so you can place it in the respawn area to obstruct the bed. We're able to see what's in the chute way better in the most recent Tommy visit. You can see a two block tall space next to the bed pixels, which is exactly where I think the respawning occurs. This is exactly what I think the respawn system looks like. So that was actually the only way I could think of escaping from the inside, but there are a few more options for breaking into the prison. The first and most obvious method is by mining into it. With a milk bucket and maybe a cow with you to refill, you can bypass the mining fatigue for a few seconds. If you're using an efficiency 5 netherite pickaxe, you should be able to mine obsidian within that time. I highly doubt that there are observers looking at every block of the wall from the inside, because that would be insanely expensive. You might think that it's possible because of the amount of obsidian that the prison is made out of, but that obsidian was actually farmed by Dream himself in the end. This is never directly said, but it's implied when Dream says this. We came up with a method of obtaining obsidian. I came up with a method of obtaining obsidian. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it may or may not um. be bending the rules, let's just say that. Bending the rules is referring to the rule that Dream implemented himself, which says that the end is off limits. Since you can farm obsidian using the end spawn platform and possibly from the huge obsidian pillars, this makes sense to me. The prison should also be hollow, since we hear mobs through the walls of the main parts of the prison. All right. There would have to be some space from the spawn, and in the building streams, we can see that a lot of space isn't actually being used. Once you're inside, you should find a way to access the cell. The main goal is to get the prisoner a bed to completely reset their spawn. The part of the prison I haven't seen anyone else consider is the bottom. In a recent stream, you can see that the bottom of the prison is made out of obsidian and seems to only be one block thick. This is proven by what we saw earlier in the Elder Guardian segment, where George finds the exposed light from the floor of the front lobby. You can use milk to mine through these blocks, or you could use ender pearls to glitch all the way up into the hollow part of the prison without breaking any blocks. Find a spot that you want to glitch through under the prison, and place a door like this on top of a block so it's right under the floor of the prison. Open it, walk in, and close it to be inside of it. You'll notice that you can't shift anymore, so make sure that you stay in place or else you might mess up. But shifting still keeps you from opening the door when you right click. Once you're in the door, hold shift and throw an ender pearl. Your head will be inside the obsidian above you, and you should be able to jump twice to phase into the prison. The reason why you glitch upwards is because your ender pearls hit the inside of the door you're in, and place your feet within the block that was originally at your head level. In the event that you come across a one tall space somehow, you want to make sure you don't ender pearl again right away. If you do this, you'll go into crawl mode and be stuck unless you have milk to mine yourself out. The way to get past this is to place a trapdoor on the block above you while facing in the direction you're standing, and open it. Your hitbox will be inside the trapdoor, just like the door in the beginning, and you can then look down and use your ender pearls again. If you're not sure where a good spot is to glitch through, you can use this cool trick I found out by having a block of glass with a top slab over it. If you walk into the side of the glass, look down at the corner of the glass and floor, and use your ender pearl, you'll be inside the glass and can see through the slab and whatever is under the prison. Once again, you would want to somehow get into the main cell to get Dream a bed, or alternatively, you could give him the materials to glitch through onto the roof himself. There's obsidian encasing the prison, which can't be blown up with TNT. But did you know that withers have the ability to destroy obsidian? When hit, it destroys all blocks next to it, except for bedrock and other command-only blocks. You might be able to use this feature to your advantage, but withers are very difficult to control, and that's why I made this system right here. This is basically a turret that shoots arrows out of these three dispensers at the wither that will be spawned in front of it. Since these arrows are coming from dispensers, there is no player for the wither to become aggravated at. It also uses a super compact clock to power the dispensers. 
I designed this so that you don't need to break any blocks when building it to avoid dealing with the mining fatigue. But if you ever need to place any extra blocks down, remember that scaffolding is versatile and can be broken instantly. Once again revisiting the Elder Guardian segment, notice how the lights that George finds are right next to the portal. The obsidian we see is actually the bottom of that portal. The six block wide line of dirt starts after the portal and ends at the edge of the prison wall. When standing in the prison wall, you can see that the actual defensive wall is placed three blocks back. This means that the portal only has three layers of blocks between it and the outside. And there isn't water between the layers either because George mines through the first layer and obsidian is shown behind it. This wall surrounds the whole prison and even Awesome Dude himself describes it the same way. This is the, the walls. They're three thick, like I said, 39 blocks tall. A lot of people think that the walls have layers of water and obsidian behind them, and that still might be the case. The front lobby is the only part of the prison that's known to be this vulnerable, and the rest could have been expanded on the inside since the last time we saw it. But let's say that the walls are three blocks thick, the wither is placed up against the defensive wall of the prison. When spawning the wither, you want to activate an invisibility potion and make sure to place water at the head level of it so it doesn't blow up any blocks around it. This explosion is the most powerful explosion in the game, so make sure you stand behind the turret as well. When the wither activates, use a sponge to get the water coming from its head and flick the lever to start the turret. The wither will be getting pushed by the arrows into the wall, and since it's taking damage, it will also destroy the blocks around it. And if the walls were actually expanded with layers, since there would be water between the obsidian, make sure to sponge it up to let the arrows keep hitting the wither, or else they'll slow down and not be able to reach it. Like I mentioned in my previous video, Elder Guardians have a 60 second cooldown for applying mining fatigue. Something a lot of modern prisons have implemented is having 60 Elder Guardians all spawned in one second apart so that the effect is applied every second as a way to deter the usage of milk buckets. However, the cooldowns of Elder Guardians are very fragile and can be reset just by reloading the chunks that they're in, and this is where an update suppressor can be really useful. An update suppressor is a device used by the technical Minecraft community to achieve things like sliced portals. It works by basically causing so many block updates at once that the game just gives up on processing them any further. It uses something called butted rails, which are powered rails that are powered when they shouldn't be, and they realize that they're not actually powered whenever they're updated. An update suppressor does this on a large scale to cause a chain reaction of updates to achieve an update overflow. You might be thinking that whatever's closest to the initial update should get updated first, but because of update order, it's actually the opposite. The rails themselves will be updated from the source of the update to the furthest point, and then they will update the blocks around them back to the source. You can prove this by having a line of observers looking at the rails with droppers behind them. If you have the droppers pointing forwards, an item will only move once in that direction. But if you have the droppers pointing the direction that the updates occur, the item will be instantly shot through to the other side. Although if an update suppressor is used incorrectly, it can be dangerous. It works as intended only when a player is the cause of an update. If something like a signal going through a repeater were to cause the update, then it would actually cause a server crash. And typically this is something you'd want to avoid, but when going up against a prison with an Elder Guardian defense, this is exactly what we need. Having the server crash and restart will completely overpower any precaution taken to keep the Elder Guardians loaded. It will effectively resync all the cooldowns of every single Guardian back to once every 60 seconds, allowing you to use a milk bucket again. The thing with update suppressors is that the devices themselves are made to be automatically reset for every use to make it easier to use, but it can cause a crash loop if it's mishandled. So for a safer method, you can just have a large number of butted rails and update them all with a repeater to get the same effect with the downside of a one-time use. And finally, you can prevent this server crashing method by using Nimbon's Carpet and Carpet Extra mods, which will allow you to enable a rule that fixes the crash method, and then no one will be able to force crash the server with it, but I'm sure there are other methods of crashing a server out there to use for a situation like this. Alright, now that I've covered the escape methods, I want to show you a few things I came up with that would make the prison a lot more secure. The very first thing to do is have the netherite block barrier up at all times. This keeps the prisoner from accessing the lava wall, which would also probably be better off disabled so that even if they got through the barrier, they can't traverse through the lava to reach the bed.
I think the most effective security improvement I have to showcase here is the respawn system I made. I actually won't be going into detail here because I have a video entirely dedicated to this respawn system that you can watch if you're interested. But basically, if you place a boat next to the bed of the prisoner and put blocks above that boat, they'll actually respawn on top of those blocks because of how bed respawns work. This is an incredible system for prisons because of how it distances the prisoner from the bed, so for Pandora's Vault you wouldn't even need the chute. The system has been showcased in Gaia's Vault and is now a common respawn system for modern prisons. I'm really glad I can contribute something useful to the prison making community, and I can't wait to see what other technical breakthroughs there may be in the future. So we already know that Awesome Dude has a bunch of observers looking at the obsidian surrounding the cell, but there's nothing that detects the chest or lectern from being broken. You can easily use an observer to detect the chest being broken. It doesn't give a pulse whenever the chest is used normally, so this is perfect. The lectern is a little more tricky though. Observers will detect when the lectern is used normally, so it would be redundant to use one here. So how else could we detect when it's broken? Well, check this out. Pufferfish detect armor stands, and so by having a pufferfish entity detector and the armor stand constantly getting pushed up by this bubble column, in the event that someone breaks this lectern, the armor stand would get pushed up and the pufferfish would stop detecting it and cause a change in redstone. What's really nice about this is the slab on top. It keeps the bubble column particles from being visible through the bottom of the lectern, and also makes sure that the armor stand can't be placed back by the prisoner to keep it from alarming the guards. Once the lectern is broken, there is nothing you can do to stop the pufferfish from going back to normal. A few segments ago I mentioned how breaking in with invisibility is still a possibility, just not super reliable. I wanted to try and make that possibility as small as possible, so I designed a player filter that tries to only let one person into the prison at a time. My goal was to make another portal that breaks itself as soon as someone goes through the portal. This will help cut off any intruders trying to come through with invisibility. This device is primed by a guard with a low render distance. The low render distance keeps the redstone line from reaching the device, and this is needed since the activation of the device is completely dependent on the visitor's arrival through the portal. When someone comes through, they will load the redstone line and instantly activate the mechanism. There are a few things going on here to get one or possibly more people into one place. The redstone line powers this dispenser on the bottom, which breaks the portal with water. The redstone also powers these dispensers with spectral arrows to help the guards see the visitor coming through. And a stasis chamber is attached to teleport the guard. The observers on top detect the broken portal and activate these pistons to push the player, as well as a pulse extender to keep the pistons activated for a while. The observer signal branches out to the side and activates two other pistons to fully align the players in the portal area and drop them down to a lightweight pressure plate. At this point, you can do whatever you want. I didn't implement anything else past this, but there is something to be aware of when using this on a server. There's a chance that the visitor coming through will be put in crawl mode underneath the first pistons that push them. This will allow them to avoid dropping down to the pressure plate, so make sure you have a way to deal with this before using it. To finish off this segment, there's something a little cheaty you could do to make invisible players visible. By using a mod by Massa called Tweakeroo, you can enable seeing invisible entities in their name tags. If you use this, building up one of the previous designs isn't really necessary, but it really depends on your personal opinion, if it's too cheaty or maybe you don't care. Either way, I'd recommend checking out Massa's other mods because they're all super useful, fast, and stable across different Minecraft versions, and if that doesn't sell it to you, just know he's a SciCraft member. Alright, so that's all I have to show. If you have any questions, feel free to ask in the comments section, and uh, bye.